Hi, and welcome to Applied Occupational Theory. We are looking at occupational behavior this week. Hopefully by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to explain occupational behavior and why it is important historically, understand the concepts of model of human occupation and understand how it developed out of the occupational behavior theory and apply model of human occupation to a case study. So as we get started, let's consider what all the different occupation-based models have in common. Well, they all have some way of representing person, environment, and occupation. Most of them have a visual representation. They also have a specific way that they were designed to look at the world. So some of them might focus more on the environment. Others might focus more on the person, such as the CMOP, where we put the human spirit in the center of the model. Others may focus more on the process of occupation. So they all have a certain way that they're trying to focus, which includes its own assumptions about those different characteristics. They also include ways of looking at function, disability, change, and motivation. And they, most of them have assessment tools developed for use with a particular model and some postulates for change that were developed, not necessarily telling you exactly what to do, but telling you how or why uh, the things that you're doing or why you're doing them. So how do we tell these occupation-based models apart if they have so much in common? Well, it's actually the same sorts of principles. So they might have slightly different focuses or very different focuses with, with a, a bit of a um, you know, nuancing going on with that. Uh, they might have different ways of focusing on the individual um, in terms of the intervention. So there are a variety of things that, that separate these models from each other. And hopefully by doing your theory analysis worksheet, you're lining up these models next to each other and starting to recognize some of the differences that they have that set them apart. And you can highlight those differences in your theory analysis worksheet to help you with the study of these different models. So let's talk about occupational behavior, the original. So Mary Riley, uh, in her 1962 Slegel lecture, gave us the great premise that many OTs wear on t-shirts uh, that has unfortunate sexist language, but remember it was 1962, so we'll just try to put in humans instead of man, that humans through the use of their hands as they're energized by mind and will can influence the state of their own health. So we have this whole profession of occupational therapy dedicated to this idea of occupation because we believe that people can get better by doing things, by engaging their mind and their will and their bodies. They can become better and stronger and um, gain wholeness, a state of wholeness. So because of that belief that we have, we need to look at those aspects in, in a variety of ways. How do we look at occupational behavior? How do we look at um, the person? How do we look at the environment and put those things together to understand how we as occupational therapists can facilitate that state of health based on occupation? So Mary Riley was the first one to think about all these things. Uh, what was going on at the time was, um, you might remember, OT got st started in the 19 teens, so 1917, along came the depression. And in order for occupational therapy to survive, we aligned ourselves with the medical model because by doing so, we could receive funding and could get the support to, to continue as a profession. So by the 40s and 50s, when Mary Riley started coming on the scene, the importance of occupation as part of occupational therapy had started to diminish. And Riley felt like we really needed to get back to our roots of occupation. Uh, she felt that occupational therapists didn't just reduce illness like medicine did, but we reduce the incapacities resulting from illness. And that was where she said we excel as occupational therapists. So occupational behavior is super important because it's the source of our paradigm shift. You'll hear this Oh, this paradigm shift, which honestly didn't fully catch on until the late 80s, early 90s, when we just had this theory explosion going on. Uh, but she was the source of all of that. Everybody points back to Mary Riley when they talk about um, how they develop their theory. It also became the basis for occupational science, and it founded several occupation-based models, most notably the MOHO. 
this is where who we are as occupational therapists really began to be shaped. And many of the concepts that Mary Riley fleshed out during that time period have ended up in our OT practice framework. Now, she had this book called Play as Exploratory Learning, which uh, was unfortunately named because it's not about play and it's not really about learning, but it's talking about play and learning as a form of adaptation, that our adaptive processes start when we're young um, and continue to develop as we grow older. But no one really understood Mary Riley, and I want to share with you why. So the very first chapter in the book is called Utopi Utopian Myths of Progress, and the first sentence goes like this. There have always been times, history and common sense tell us, when certain classes of people in certain kinds of societies fail to be caught up and swept along in the mainstream of progress. She goes on like this for over 300 pages, and she's very difficult to understand. So she's kind of way up here, and the rest of us are hang hanging out down here. Oops, sorry about that. We'll get back up here. And, um, we're, you know, she's very difficult to understand. And I can just imagine Gary Kielhoffner sitting in Mary Riley's class and going, man, her philosophy is really cool. She's very philosophical, great stuff about occupation. No one's going to get this. No one's going to understand it. It needs to be translated into a usable format uh, for people to be able to use. So let's define what Mary Riley meant by occupational behavior. So she said occupational behavior are activities that occupy a person's time, involve achievement, and address the economic realities of life. So let's talk about this definition a little bit because there are some things here that are different from the way that we look about occupation today. So first of all, she equates activities and occupation. If you remember back to PEO, we talked about how in that model we have nested concepts of occupation, that we have activities, tasks, and then occupation. She doesn't really separate those out. She says uh, occupation is a certain kind of activity. Um, time is an important factor. Goals are important. This person is trying to achieve something, so having goals are important. And also, as far as the work aspect of occupation, this addresses the economic realities of life. So a little bit different definition than some of the other uh, models that we're used to seeing as far as how we define occupation, or we would use the word occupational performance or occupational engagement, but she uses the term occupational behavior and defines it a little differently. Now, she says that the goal or focus of occupational therapy is to prevent and reduce disruptions and incapacities in occupational behavior. Again, what do you notice about that? She's not looking at um, a positive, like in terms of like wellness, but she looks at it more like we're going to stop a negative. We're going to prevent and reduce disruptions in occupational behaviors. But what she was trying to do with that kind of language was draw the distinction between the medical model and what occupational therapists do, what, what it means to have that occupation-based focus. So there are 10 basic assumptions, and I am not going to read these all to you. And in fact, these 10 assumptions were not in the original form. They were actually um, created by Colin Tufano just to kind of gather up the threads of thought that Mary Riley had and try to translate it for us today. I will say, this is a good point for me to say, there is no visual model. Uh, Mary Riley did not create for us any kind of flow chart or diagram or anything like that. But what we used when I was in school, because this was the only theoretical model that we studied because it was the only one available in the, in the early 80s. Um, Gary Kielhoffner had started to work on the MOHO, but it was um, not published in a form that was readily available to everybody yet. So we used this upward spiral. And we'll get to where we talk about exploration, competence, and achievement as part of the upward spiral of occupational behavior uh, that Mary Riley talked about. One of the most important aspects of this model is to consider the time in which it was developed and that development or lifespan approach was a highly regarded way of thinking about um, anything as far as helping humans at that point in time. Uh, theories were very developmentally focused at that time. 
Development has kind of gone out of vogue because we um, now understand very different things about um, how people develop, especially um, once they're beyond childhood. Um, but we now understand, um, we're, we're looking at how in this historical model, uh, Mary Riley was saying that development strongly influences people. And so when she says play is exploratory learning, she's actually thinking about taking a person from when they play to learn things to when they work and they're adapting in a work type environment. She also uh, had a nod toward the environment, although she didn't really say the word environment. She said society and culture. So she specifically looked at those aspects on how people's occupational choices are influenced by that. She was especially interested in how we use occupations to cope and adapt, that we learn how to adapt in our environments based on the occupations in which we engage. Uh, she also made the comment that occupational behavior can, it can be something that we see that's tangible, that we can measure, but it also has an affective or subjective component. There's a meaning to it. There's a meaning for the person. And then she uh, equates kind of the learning and the, and the um, adaptation parts of it. So what is function and dysfunction in this model? Function in occupational behavior is being able to seek, undertake, and adapt occupations that meet your personal needs as well as those of society. So there's, there's that integration with society piece. Disin dysfunction um, or disability is evident when a person is suffering, that's the word she uses, from the lack of occupational fulfillment, uh, uh, competency, or achievement. So um, a person can, um, you know, have a lack of uh, self-competence and mastery in regard to a particular occupation. Um, and um, she, at this point, ties roles and occupations very closely together. So change is all about intrinsic motivation and personal dynamics. Uh, so the person has to have this intrinsic drive toward mastery in order to change. And in order to motivate them, the occupational therapist will use those internal resources of drive toward mastery in order to help them to get better. So Mary Riley did not necessarily specify uh, an assessment tool. She does in her book have sort of a play skills inventory, um, it was never validated. Uh, you know, there's not even um, really any literature on, on how that was ever used in practice. But there are some recommendations for um, sort of older assessment tools that were used with um, occupational behavior, including the interest checklist, Takata's play history questionnaire, and the inventory of occupational choice skills. There are actually some newer ones now um, that are available you know, through MOHO that, that are probably more contemporary, um, you know, more, more toward what uh, people living today would use. Um, so for interventions, uh, Mary Riley says we need to use occupations to promote adaptations. Now she doesn't tell us exactly what we're supposed to do in order to do that. And she says it's all dependent on the person and your therapeutic use of self with that person. And as long as you're looking at the person, looking at their desired occupations, looking at ways to use those occupations to promote adaptation, um, and preventing and reducing those incapacities in occupational behavior, then you're on the right track for doing occupational therapy with that person. So research is, uh, you know, basically non-existent with this model because of the time period that it's from. So there were some case methods uh, that were that were completed. You know, basically, I tried it with this case and it worked really well. Um, there are some case examples, of course, in her uh, playbook. And uh, that's pretty much the research that we have on it from the time period. So just to recap on occupational behavior, it has a historical import importance. Uh, it, the whole concept of occupational behavior is embedded in that Mary Riley's great hypothesis that man through the use of his hands and so forth. Um, we have this upward spiral of exploration, competence, and achievement, um, and people have the need for mastery. So here are my references, and thank you for joining me today.